All right, so uh, we've been talking about uh, Ephesians. Casey's been guiding us through that, some of the books of Paul. And uh, we'll get right into it today. I mean, the reality is, as I was reading the chapter uh, that I'm focusing on today and the verses, I was thinking about what this year symbolizes. And I think most of them have already left the room. Um, But most students, this is a time of year of uh, graduation, of moving on to what is next Uh, in their life, and maybe it's just another grade, Um, maybe it's out of junior high or high school, out of college, Uh, Jake is here somewhere, and I'm proud of Jake that he's graduating, yeah, and and one of the things that always happens this time of year is is after all the hard work and all the labor, uh, you come to this ceremony, and unfortunately, it seems like because of COVID, everybody's missing out on the wonderful opportunity of commencement, uh, which is that graduation celebration. And at all those graduations, there's always, um, you know, there'll be like the smart students who will get to talk, maybe the student body president, um, but there's also someone who will come in and do the commencement speech. Sometimes it's the president of the university or the school. Sometimes it's an alumni or someone who's uh, really accomplished quite a bit in their life. And so they're there to be kind of a motivational speaker and give you some, some pointers as you start off into your new path of how to have success like they do. And, uh, you know, I, 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 we could go through them real quick. I just, real fast, to just like catch your breath and break a little ice. Um, I have a couple of graduation cards I wanted to show you that I found online as we think about commencement and graduating. So go ahead and put the first one up there. I don't know if you can read it, but you're destined for greatness. <laughs> so cheesy. All right, next one. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, keeping the dream alive with Trump. Graduating is going to be huge. Next, Kanye, if you can't see that. It's Kanye West. That's my favorite. All right, next. There's no words, but the painting itself just tells. It's a miracle from God that we graduate. And I think it's the last one. If you can't read, it says, congrats, grad. You have truly made the best of a crappy situation. (laughs) Tied in with COVID. I threw in there just because I like to see them. My, My wife and kids is that picture of our family. There we are, celebrating, uh, celebrating in an event. And then one more picture of the girls. There they are. Look at them. Our oldest is graduating first grade, moving into second. And our youngest is graduated the potty and is, you know, <laughs> or, or graduated diapers and is at, yes, the potty, yes. <laughs> We're thankful for the potty. If they're at home, I love you girls and uh, watching online. And uh, so lots of things to celebrate, uh, graduation and commencement. And as I was reading through this passage of Ephesians, uh, really one of the things that stuck out to me, what we've been talking about, and, and not just this passage for today, but the entirety of the book, is that Ephesians, in a way, is a commencement speech from Paul to the church. One of the things that makes the book of Ephesians stand out is some of the other books are correctional books from Paul to the people, to the churches. They've done something wrong that he's like, I gotta come in and tell you this is wrong. You need to fix this. Deal with this problem. Um, or other issues. But with, with the church of Ephesus, uh, his letter is different. And a lot of people describe it as one of the most beautiful, powerful works of art in the Bible, this book. And so as I was reading it and thinking about that, I, I, you know, taking time to stop and be thankful, God, thank you so much for speaking through Paul that we could have this, that we could have instruction and guidance on what our life should look like as we try to follow you and try to become like Christ. And so I'm going to carry on. Last week, Casey did chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And I'm going to skip just a little bit ahead, but I'm in chapter 4. Real simple, it says this, verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. It grows and it builds itself up in love as each part does its work. 
That's a powerful passage of scripture, and I don't know if any of you recognized it, but just like any good commencement speech, there's those one-liners that you really hold on to. And in this passage, did any of you notice some things that you've heard before that we, Casey's talked about? Did any of you notice the fivefold ministry in there? The pastors and preachers and teachers and uh, evangelists and prophets, we talk about that all the time that we're all called, we all have a role to play in saying, God, what have you made me to, to build up the body and to testify of your love around me? Um, also that famous quote there in verse 14 that talks about not being thrown back and forth by the waves of different teaching and ideas and culture, but having a foundation. So just in these couple of verses, it's like chock full of good truth for us. And again, thinking back to Paul and, and what he's writing the church in Ephesus, some background on it is that Ephesus was a church where Paul spent the majority of his time. There was not one other church and group of people that had, had received as much teaching as Ephesus. He spent more than any other time anywhere else time training these people to go and plant churches and to spread the good news and be effective in their community. And so he's very involved. And, and while he's writing this book, he's in prison. And he, in chapter three, he'll talk specifically about, I'm in prison, this is what's going on, he's updating them. And it's clear in his life that his journey on earth is coming to an end. He's aware of that. He doesn't know when it's gonna happen, but he knows his journey is coming to an end. And in a way, the book of Ephesus, uh, Ephesians, is he's passing off the baton saying, I've taught you well, I've taught you everything I know, and now it's time, like Casey said, for unity and risk. It is time to come together, and it's time to start taking some risks and start putting your faith into action. And so Paul is, is, is praying over them. It's not just a teaching, but it really reminds me of Jesus at the, the Last Supper with the disciples when he's talking about, you know, Father, I, I pray over them. I pray that they be united in your love. In, in the Last Supper, Jesus is teaching, but he's praying over his disciples, praying that, that they'd be kept from the evil one who wants to snuff them out, praying that they be unified and filled with power. And so this is a commencement speech. It's, it's the end of the line for me, but I'm passing the baton, and now it's your turn to go out and do something about it. And like I said, some of the things that stick out, of course, the fivefold ministry, which we've gone through a bunch, and we'll, I'm sure in the future do more of that. Um, in there, also, what Paul is saying is that God has given us gifts as part of his promise and his inheritance. He's making a connection there because he's speaking to the children of God. He's speaking to Christians and saying, if you are a child of God, if you're being made in Christ's image, you have a purpose. Part of your inheritance is power from God to take part in the world around you and spread the gospel and see his kingdom come. You get to be a part of that. You know, the prayer that Jesus says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The Bible talks about that Jesus was saying that the kingdom of God is now, it's at hand, and it was through his life and his actions. And did you know we're called for the same thing? It's not just enough for us to say, God, let your kingdom come. No, God, let your kingdom come in me. Let me be a part of bringing your kingdom on earth. That's what Paul is speaking to his church. And so this is such a powerful passage of scripture where it's saying you have a purpose, you have an inheritance. But also Paul is, it goes into that verse talking about not swaying back and forth, having a foundation. Paul right away and throughout this entire book, he makes the distinction that something is so important is having a sound mind. Having a foundation where no matter what your culture says, no matter how you feel day to day, that your foundation is secure. You know who you are, you know who God is, and you know what your purpose is. That kind of foundation is so important. And when I look at Paul's writings, what's interesting is he's writing this from prison. If there's ever been a time for him to doubt, for him to say, I don't know, God, if you're, you're proud of me, is this judgment because I used to persecute Christians as well? I thought I was serving you and I was, I was executing those that, that follow Jesus and throwing them in prison. Is this my punishment, God? Because Christians at that time, lots of them doubted him. The Jews hated him. The Romans didn't like him. Like poor Paul, he is by himself. And it could be so easy for him to be there locked up in prison with his life hanging by a thread and say, I, I don't know that what I believe at all anymore. I, I give up. I, I don't even know what's right. I, I must have missed the mark somehow. But in the spite, and I, I love the, the contrast, in spite of what Paul's going through, I love that while he may not be free physically, it is very clear throughout Ephesus and throughout his different books, he has never been more free in his entire life. His body is locked in prison, but his spirit is so free and so on fire, and there's nothing that can stop that. And I love that Paul is telling us that. He's saying, look at my example, like a commencement speech. You want to learn how to have success? You want to learn how to be effective in God's kingdom? Follow my example. 
But also Paul recognizes that there is an enemy. There is something that's going to get in the way of us taking risks and of us being unified. And while I'm sure we could go through an entire list of some of those specific things, uh, one of the biggest ones that sticks out to me the most is fear. Paul goes right at it. He goes right at the topic of fear. And he's going to address it and say, you are called to be fearless in the face of circumstances that are, are beyond your control. When you're standing like at graduation or you're coming out of a pandemic and you're saying, okay, God, what next? Well, where, where do I go from here? What's the next step? Fear will keep you crippled. Fear will say, oh man, that was a bad last year. You better hunker down for more because there's more damage coming. But fearlessness, like Paul's talking about, I think it would say something different. Paul's going to focus a lot as he's talking about fearlessness in some of his other books. And like I said, there's so many quotes that are so good from Paul that I'm sure most of you could remember, at least little pieces because you've heard them before. But a couple of the ones is Paul is addressing the mind and how important it is to have a, a stable foundation in your mind about who God is and who you are. The first ones, everybody knows this one, Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren and sisterin, however you want to say it, whatever things are true, whatever things are honorable, whatsoever things that are just, whatsoever things that are pure and the things that are lovely and the things that are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. Fill your mind daily with that kind of stuff. And if what you're hearing on the news doesn't line up with that, then throw it out, right? Also, a great one, Romans 12 too, one of my favorites, so simple but so powerful. Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I love the progression there. He's saying transformation. Who doesn't want to be transformed into the image of Christ? But how do we get there? By the renewing of our mind. Our mind comes first. And from the truth in our mind flows the transformation. We begin to make change. And I love that. And Paul's very, he, he's very aware of that. He's experienced that in his own life. And so he begins to call it out and say, if we're going to battle against fear, and we're going to take these steps, it starts in the mind, reminding yourself who you are and who God is. I love, there was uh, one other passage I love is, is uh, 2 Corinthians 3. I don't remember if it's on the screen or not, but Paul says this. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I told you Paul's good with one-liners, right? He's got like 100 top, top hits and Grammys and all that kind of stuff in the, the Christian world. And we who are unveiled faces, uh, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Some translations, instead of saying intensifying glory, it'll talk from glory to glory, the journey of transformation. It's a continual thing. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think about uh, like renewing your car insurance every year, you know, or, or whatever, different renewals. It's not a one-time thing. I'm saved. God's transformed me. I'm good to go. No, it's a daily thing. The renewing of your mind, coming back to what is true, what God says about us. And you know, most fears, um, and I know Paul dealt with this. I'm sure we all are. I'm sure the church in Ephesus did. Most fears are rooted in some kind of trauma, right? The things that we fear normally kind of line up with this idea of not being accepted, being rejected, and not loved. And most of us, I would say, anywhere you go, you know, any, any topic of your life, the topic of fear being related to rejection and, and lack of love, most people studies show that's related way back to childhood, maybe in their family, maybe in their social groups. And those are our pathways. Those are damages in a way. I don't want it to sound hopeless, but those are damages that are done to our spirit that take time. Those take time to rewrite the truth about who we are. And so I love that Paul understands from his own experience, because he clearly still deals with his own issues and challenges and his own pain from his past, but he's walking in freedom. And I love that this passage of scripture, as well as other things that Paul teaches us, give us some easy steps. And it's not overnight. Conquering your fears and rewriting the truth about who you are is a process. The renewal of your mind, it takes time. But just a couple things, and on, on your sheet, I call them real quickly, just my four shuns, all right? And uh, the first one is going to be uh, revelation. It's the Spirit of God who reveals to each of us the state of our heart and our beliefs. 
And uh, also, it's our responsibility. We take, you know, we talk about it all the time, taking personal inventory, being self-aware of where we are at with God. And I didn't read the rest of the chapter. We don't have time today for chapter four, but Paul, as he's writing to the church in Ephesus, after he talks about not being swayed, he goes into talking about kind of a list of things that are like, you probably shouldn't live this way anymore. He's challenging them, saying, you're God's children. His, his power's upon you. You're going to do amazing things. But there's also maybe some things in our life, because we're still sinful human beings, that we should look in the mirror and say, I don't want that in my life anymore. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's habits. Whatever it may be, saying, God, like, I recognize by your spirit that that part of my life shouldn't, shouldn't be a part of me anymore. That's not, that's not of you, God. That's not what you have for me. So the first step is revelation. Paul talks about that all the time, talking about uh, that God is revealing to us constantly uh, his will and his spirit. So the first one is, is just the revelation, the understanding. God, point, show me uh, my heart. Show me maybe the error of my ways or the things that you, you want to challenge me to let go of. The second one is implementation. And that's implanting the truth in your mind and meditating on what is true. So you look in the mirror, we start with the revelation of understanding, okay, maybe there's some things in my life or some fear that I'm dealing with, or maybe it's these false ideas about who I am. And so I, I, I want to call it what it is and say, I've got an issue, I've got a challenge here that I want to conquer. What's the first step? You continue to remind yourself and renew your mind on what is true about God and what he says about you. I love that Psalm 1, David writes about it, and he says that the righteous man meditates on the word of God, the truth of God, day and night. You want to be a righteous person. You want to fill your mind with what is true and good and noble and virtuous. You meditate on God's word. You meditate on the good things, the testimony that God has done. You get around people who you are like, man, you're on fire. I see you being fearless. I want some of that. You meditate on that. You put yourself around those kind of people. So first, revelation. Second, implementation. You, you, you implant into your mind the truths of who God is. Third, separation. And I've talked about this a lot in my own personal life. This one is a huge one that I'm so passionate about because it's one thing to be implanting into your mind truth, but it only goes so far if you've still got screaming voices coming at you telling you something different, right? So if that's, again, it could be the news, it could be media, it could be relationships. In my case, it was family. And that's a hard one to deal with, man. My family's in ministry. I grew up in the church. And having to come to the point of realizing if I continue to submit myself to these kinds of rules, if I continue to submit my life and people please, I, I literally don't know who I am. I've lost my sense of who God has made me to be. When I first met my wife, I couldn't even pick where we would go for a date night for food because I was so confused about what the heck I wanted with my life. And it's still a process. It's still breaking out seven years later. But I can tell you from my own experience, my own little commencement speech to you all, that I've never been more happy and more healthy in my life and my family than I am now. And it was one thing to, to be struggling saying, oh, can I, can I walk the fence on both? Can I believe what God says about me, but you know, not, not cause any waves or frustrate people or stand up for myself? Can I just you know, let these words and these actions, but oh, they're not gonna affect me. They're not, they're not gonna get in the way. It doesn't work that way. When you're around those toxic beliefs, when you're around people who are telling you different from what God says about you, it, it, it doesn't just bounce off you and go away. It's going to stay there, and in the hard times, it's going to challenge everything you believe. So putting, implanting the truth also requires getting rid of the junk, wiping out the stuff and the voices, and even like I said, like Paul says, the actions that aren't lined up with everlasting life, with abundant life, whatever that might be. So we start with the revelation. Second, implementation. We bring God's word, his truth, what is good and pure into our minds and our lives, and we meditate on it. We spend our time giving thanks. And instead of sitting in front of, uh, you know, TV, locking our windows, storing up for the next five years, and, the, you know, the next Holocaust that's coming to the church or whatever people are saying now, we say, no, God, you've given me this day to make the most of it. I want to go and share your love. I want to be a hard worker. I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good mom. I want to be a good sibling. I want to be a good friend, God. Show me what it means to have the fullness of Christ, like Paul writes. The fullness, everything that Jesus was. The way he interacted with others. The way he spent his time. The way he connected with the Father. The way he saw the world. In the fullness of Christ in every area of our life. 
that, that promise is there, that it's ours for the taking to take some of these steps and get closer to Jesus. So, and, and, and the fourth and final one is fortification. And that ties right in with what Casey was talking about last week with unity. It really requires people having a relationship. Uh, but I'll also say this, and we talk about it all the time. Not everyone's going to be your best friend. You might like hang out with me for coffee and be like, he's just weird. I don't know. I, I like him. He's okay, but I can never be his friend. Like, it's fine. Not everyone's going to be your best friend. And not everyone is supposed to be your mentor. And the way that I see mentorship is, is not that the mentor comes at you and says, hey, you, you need to submit to me because I'm in charge. No, it's the mentee is the one who looks. And so if you stop and you think, you know, what would, what would a, a abundant life look like in my relationships, in my job, in my schooling, in my family? You know, to define what that would look like and then to look around you at people who are successful at it and say, okay, let me learn from that person. Because if I say, you know, I want to learn how to be a good dad and I go and learn from someone who's a jerk, like that's probably not going to work out too well for me, right? But you don't blindly follow. You look, you open your eyes and say, God, would you send people in my path? Would you help me recognize the strengths and values of those around me that I could learn and, and, and take from that, but also have something to offer others as well? So it's not, it's not foolproof. I'm sure there's tons of other things we could add, but the four shuns one more time. Uh, revelation. God, open my eyes to the things in my life that you're challenging me about. Second is implementation, to implement the word of God into our hearts and our minds, especially starting with our minds. Third is separation. Cut it out. The toxic voices. If there are people in your life who are saying anything other than what is true about who you are and God is, I'm sorry, in love, spend your time somewhere else. And number four, the final one again was fortification. Fortify your life with rich and lasting relationships of people that you look at and say, you know, I want them to, to say my commencement speech. I want them to be the ones speaking over me in my life. Paul is aware he's coming to the end of his journey. And so in a way, like I said, Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, that, that Paul is speaking to Ephesus, this is his um, commencement speech to them. He knows I've, I've run the good race. At the end of this book is a great passage about putting on the armor of God. Like, Ephesus is so rich and so full. I encourage you, read the rest of chapter four today when you have time. Go through the rest of the book and remind yourself what Casey's been speaking about these past few weeks. It's unbelievable. And Paul is, fine, is giving his final encouragement and instruction to his students, the church in Ephesus, multiple churches. He's telling them, all right, some lasting thoughts, some final thoughts. Here's how you should live your life and what it should look like challenging them to continue inputting what is true, testing it out by their actions, to live fearlessly. Inspiration and motivation is what he is preaching to them and reminding them of who they are in Christ and of the glory that awaits them. You know, um, I was thinking about commencement speeches and I was thinking back to college and every single year, the uh, president of the university would always read a book at commencement. And I remember at the time, I don't know why, I, I probably was just goofing around. I was in like the orchestra and choir, so we had to be at every one since I was a freshman. So I, I just, I didn't pay that much attention to it. But it was a special book, and I want to read a little bit of it uh, to you all today. Um, even though it's, you know, not the Bible, it still has some great thoughts in it. Uh, a great philosopher known as Dr. Seuss. And it's the book called, Oh, the Places You'll Go. And if you know this book, it's a fantastic book. Uh, I swear every time we read it to our girls at home, I get way more out of it than they do. Uh, maybe they like the colorful pictures or whatever. But uh, I brought the book and I wanted to read just a couple of spots to you. Because the truth is, is no matter where you're at, if you're celebrating graduation in your life, you're celebrating coming out of COVID, still breathing and alive and well, or whatever. Uh, if you're not right now, you will be at some point at a crossroads. You'll be at a point where you have come through some kind of a journey and you say, what next? And if we follow Paul's example, we see that the church in Ephesus was there. They were under heavy persecution. They weren't going to be able to rely on Paul's teaching anymore. He was going to be gone. And he was passing the baton. And so this question of where do I go and what's next? I mean, talk about fear. That's one of the most scary places is saying, I don't know what to do next. God, help me, guide me. And so Paul is saying, be fearless. Go after it. Even though you don't have all the answers, if you believe that God's grace is with you, then you can accomplish anything. Amen. Believing that for each one of us, that as a united body, God has incredible things. The, Paul said the, the fullness of Christ as we unite together, but also to remember that each one of us has our own calling. 
Each one of us has our own purpose. Each one of us has our own priceless value. And so to be encouraged and to go head on into the questions, to go head on into the next phase of life and say, God, I don't have all the answers, but I trust you. And through you, anything is possible. So here we go, a little bit of all oh, the places you'll go. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet on your shoes. Uh, feet in your shoes, not on. <laughs> feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know, and you are the guy who will decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some, you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not-so-good street. And you may not find any you want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there in the wide open air. Out there, things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along. You'll start happening too. Oh, the places that you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have great speed. You'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest. Except when you don't. Because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch and your gang will fly on. You'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump and the chances are then that you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. You will come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're darked. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn right or left? Or uh, right and three quarters, or maybe not quite? Or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid you will find. For a mind maker upper to make up his mind. You can get so confused that you'll start, uh, start into race, down long wiggled roads at a breakneck pace, and grind on for miles across weirdish wild space, headed, I fear, towards the most useless place, the waiting place. For people just waiting, waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go or the mail to come or a rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for yes and no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting, waiting for the fish to bite, waiting for wind to fly a kite, waiting around for Friday night, waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No, that is not for you. Somehow you'll escape all the waiting and staying. You'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing. With banner flip flapping, once more you'll ride high, ready for anything under the sky, ready because you're that kind of guy. Oh, the places you'll go. There's fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. You'll be the famous, you'll be as famous as famous can be with the whole wide world watching you win on TV. That's cool. Except when they don't, because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games you can't win because you'll play against you. All alone, whether you like it or not, Alone will be something 
uh, alone will be something you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. There's that fear. But on you will go, through the, though the weather be foul. On you will go through the enemy's prowl. On you will go through the hack and crack's howl. Onward up many a frightening creek, though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. On and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft, and never mix up your right foot with your left. And will you succeed? Yes. Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three-fourth percent guaranteed. It says, kid, you will move mountains. And the final page. So, be your name Bucksbaum or Bixie or Bray or Mordecai, Ollie, Van Allen, O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So, get on your way. It's a cool book. You know what I love? And, and we're done. Um, I love that the Bible says the promise from Jesus is that the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. You know what's just as powerful? When that mountain stays put and you march right over the top of it with God's help. And you get to the top and you see the new view and maybe you don't know where to go next, but you're like, God, look what we've conquered together. To not be afraid, to be unified and risk, to take Paul's advice and fight against fear with everything in us and instead of fear and the junk of the world to replace it with what is true and what is good, that we are God's children and we are called and it's through our lives that his kingdom is coming. God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your word. God, I'm humbled by, by Paul's writings. I'm humbled by your love today. You're so good to us, God. And, and in spite of us, in spite of our, our, our doubt, I think of, of the man in the Bible that you're healing who says, I believe, but help my unbelief. There's part of me that's really strong in believing, and then there's other times where the mountain maybe is just a little too high, or maybe the forest is a little too dark. I don't know where to go next. And God, you are with us. And all you ask that in faith, we keep moving with you. You're going to show us where to go. You're going to direct us, God. And so, God, I pray that the spirit of fear, like, like these songs say, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies, louder than the unbelief, because my weapon is a melody, and heaven is fighting for me. Those are not words of fear. Those are songs of confidence and power. And I pray that over your church today, not just here, but across the world. God, that, that fear would continue to lose its hold on us, as that song says. Fear, you've lost your hold on me. I am free, and I celebrate what God is doing. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God. Amen. i